passer à une autre vision. Now we're going to move on to another vision, which is extremely complementary and uh, uh, very important to the moment. It's about France being a partner country, which France working from Hong Kong, and friends, some French companies are going to share their vision. We've got three speakers this morning. The rules of the game haven't changed. Ten minutes per speaker and we'll have a Q&A session in the end. So first of all, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Eve Zlotowski, who is the chief economist of COFACE. In French, we use the same expression, uh, chief economist. And he works for COFACE. Uh, every, as everyone knows, COFACE is an extremely important organization that gives analysis that provides analysis and that also does a lot of uh, work in the field of finance. So we're going to now listen to you, Mr. Yves Zatowski. The floor is yours. Merci. Alors, je crois que vous Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Hong Kong is extremely important for COFACE. We've been there since 1996, and uh, we have an insurance credit business there in uh, for Asia. For us, Asia is not just mainland China, but also Australia, India, and the entire Asia-Pacific region. So for us, it's an extremely important base. Uh, Hong Kong is an extremely important base. So I'm just going to give you, uh, share with you a few uh, slides to share our analysis of the Hong Kong and China, Chinese economy. So we have to closely monitor the corporate risk. Could we have the slides up, please? So first of all, I'd like to say something. Hong Kong is working in an extremely dynamic environment. Asia is an extremely dynamic environment, and you will see the growth rate that we are forecasting. Of course, it gives me a lot of uh, optimism, and it reassures me the growth rate is forecast at 6.3% much more than the emerging countries, which is 4.3%. So we've got very dynamic economies for three main reasons. First of all, China is very dynamic. We really believe in mainland China, and the growth rate is 7%. In Asia, we've got very good uh, economies with high added value, and we also have uh, uh, new countries in, China, in Asia that are uh, growing hard, uh, growing at a very fast rate, where the middle class is expanding, where the consumption is really high, like Philippines and Indonesia. And the third point is uh, inter-Asia business. It's true that world business is slowing down, but there's something that is supporting world business, and that's regional business in Asia. And Hong Kong is really uh, tapping into this. So what are the perform what is the performance of Hong Kong in this region? Hong Kong is v doing really well. We had a growth of 3.7%. The business went down by 2.9%, unfortunately. But there was a major credit crunch in 2009. And of course, Hong Kong is at the heart of the financial sector and did suffer a beating and did come back very weakly. So we have a 2 to 3% growth. So it, it's going to be 2.5% for next year, the growth rate. This is a forecast growth rate, of course. I don't have the slides, so I'm going to continue my presentation. So if you see the economic climate in Hong Kong, there was a negative growth in uh, the second quarter. This was basically due to adjustment of real estate prices. And the consumption is also rather down the trade is down. And of course, with the political events, the protests and everything, uh, there's going to be a slowdown of the growth rate. But traditionally, you see in Hong Kong, we had many negative quarters, but the economy does bounce back in a very positive way and very quickly because the Hong Kong economy is very strong. It has very solid bases, very good surpluses, very good trade surpluses, and also low inflation and low uh, unemployment. So this is extremely important for an economy where exports account for more than 200,000 million. 
of uh, so this is why an economy that is rather subject to the vol volatility uh, it's good to have solid basis which insulates the economy from crisis. So when you look at the Hong Kong economy, it's the real estate prices. You know that the real, est real estate prices have gone up by 300 percent since 2012. And the prices went down in between February and July 2014. And ever since, they've been up. It's clear that the Hong Kong government has really started tackling this question of real estate prices, especially by limiting mortgage credit and also they have actually launched a program of construction. You see, real estate has a major role to play and we really fear that there's going to be a major correction, major adjustment in the prices of real estate, but this did not take place. So we can say that the risk of real estate has been well managed and it's not going to take its toll on the economy. The second thing that you need to be watchful is that uh, the Hong Kong economy is very closely tied to the Chinese mainland economy, and it's 60 percent of uh, the foreign trade. Uh, so uh, Hong, uh, the Hong Kong economy has outsourced its industry in China, in mainland China, and now they export uh, services to mainland China. So services account for 80% of the GDP, which is really huge. So we have an export eco service export economy, which is rather uh, major. So you have this uh, weight of China, you've got the foreign trade, and you also have to Chinese tourists flocking in to Hong Kong and spending a lot of money. And of course, the uh, increase in real estate was also due to that, due to the inflow of tourists. So this extreme important and this does have negative effects as well on the uh, country like uh, the real estate prices Hong Kong should adapt to China China is slowing down let's just talk about the Chinese economy now so now the Chinese economy the growth rate is 7.3 percent now it's a really great growth rate you have to actually remind yourselves that the Chinese economy grew by 10.3% in 2009. So now it's slowing down. Now, this slowing down is a good thing. It's a good thing because when you look at the objective of uh, the Chinese government, it's really what the government wants. They really want to slow down the growth. So when you look at the growth, when you look at the Chinese growth, it's the next slide, please. Yes, the next one. You can actually see that, uh, right. So you can actually see the targets of the Chinese government and the growth. The growth actually corresponds to the targets here. So this uh, slowing down is important. We had uh, growth based on export and investment, and this growth has to has slowed down because it has created surpluses in several se sectors, in construction, in uh, solar energy. We had major problems in the sector. So now the slowdown is uh, sigh of relief. And what's really important is the rebalancing of the Chinese growth. And if you see the components of the Chinese growth in the graph to your left, it's the recomposition of growth with more consumption, less investment. And this is taking place gradually. And it's, uh, it's an upstream uh, climb. So we really have to have growth based on consumption. And we're not still there as yet. And why so? Because this investment is extremely dynamic. It continues to be more dynamic than consumption. When you see the latest results, the investment is growing higher than retail sale. Why? Because f in, we are funding investment. The bank loans, even though bank loans have gone down, it still has a growth rate that's higher than nominal growth. And the second element is that you have the development of alternative finances, the shadow banking sector, which is replaces the official credit. And this is continuing to uh, generate the trend in the next slide. 
you can see the impact on corporate risk for us. For We are credit insurers, and we have a very high exposure to uh, Chinese companies. Now, what are, is causing us worry is the debt levels, the official debt and also the non-official, non-transparent debt. The debt, Chinese corporate, uh, the Chinese corporate debt is estimated uh, to be at 200% of the GDP, which is an extremely high leverage. And of course, if you have a slowing down of the growth, high debt, trade surpluses, and you can see the ingredients have been met so that the corporate debt risk must be really uh, monitored, and you also have the prices that are going down, and most of these uh, prices, again, have led to a high credit risk on Chinese companies. Last but not the least, I wanted to tell you that COFAS is carrying out a country review. So this is our country review. We are looking at the credit risk on companies. We're talking of uh, corporate credit risk and not government credit risk. And we look at the macroeconomic data. We're looking at our own experience, our own payment experience. And lastly, we are looking at the average transparent transparency. Because for a credit insurance insurer, transparency is extremely important. If we have transparency, we can actually take risks and we can have a major credit uh, exposure. So this country review has been carried out at seven levels, A, B, C, uh, D. So there's not a problem to present this in Hong Kong. As you can see in the next slide, Hong Kong has the best rating. It's A1. We have a very good uh, payment experience from Hong Kong, from companies based in Hong Kong. Now, between, 2000, between 2009 and July 2010, uh, Hong Kong lost its rating due to the credit cr crunch. And very quickly, the situation improved, and it got back its A1 rating because uh, the economy sprung back very quickly. So you see, we've got very good um, optimistic news. We had a lot of reclassification here. Philippines was reclassified. Indonesia was reclassified. Cambodia as well. So you can see that all these countries of course, these are very diverse in terms of risks, but you see the overall news is positive. Now, the major challenge for emerging Asia and China and Hong Kong is to adapt to the changes in China. And when you can see the results until now, we can be optimistic with regards to the future. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having invited me to this forum because uh, this is going to actually give me an opportunity to express my gratitude to Hong Kong. This, Hong, this city has actually given Veolia a lot and has also helped Veolia to grow in Asia, to expand in Asia. Even before Hong Kong was a springboard or a hub, it was a territory. It was a very densely populated region with a, a population that's rather high, uh, with a very strong economic growth, and also a lot of stringent requirements from the local authorities. So this concentration, this population is concentrated on a very, very small territory. So you really need a complex uh, energy and water and waste management system. And Hong Kong, for a very long time, has trusted Veolia to implement solutions that currently have become benchmarks in the world. Now, whether it's for our uh, toxic waste treatment plant or for hospitals or for the waste management of uh, sewage sludge, it's, for instance, a cold networks in, at airports and everything. So Hong Kong 
has become a territory where we can really express our talent. It's a very, very demanding territory in terms of environmental protection and public services management, public utilities management, sorry. And it's become a benchmark for the world. And this is the first reason why, this is the prime reason why we have a regional office in Hong Kong. Generally, we can say that it's companies that make the territory live. But for Veolia, it's the other way around. You, first of all, have to live, and only then can you provide services. So we really wanted to express our gratitude and also help people who've helped us live. So this is the first reason why we've implanted in uh, we've set up base uh, a regional office in Hong Kong. There are of course other regions as well, other reasons as well. The next reason is undoubtedly because Hong Kong is a hub the infrastructure level, the transport network, the way Hong Kong is linked to the whole continent, and it really helps us work seamlessly, especially in northern Asian countries, because this is where Veolia is very de well developed, China, Korea, and Japan. The second reason of our, uh, why we've set up shop in Hong Kong is because the human resources and talent that's readily available in this region. So you have employees who are extremely well-trained. They've been to foreign universities. They are used to working in an international environment. And the policy of our company is to recruit locally and delegate good positions. And Hong Kong actually helped us do that. Most of the responsibilities lie with the locals, with the residents of Hong Kong. So there is a talent pool. And this really helps us do businesses in neighboring countries in the region as well. And this really helps us develop even faster if we had to actually train up human resources in each of these local countries. Last reason, a series of uh, last reasons why big companies should have a base in Hong Kong. It's the efficiency of the administration of the government and the organization. There is, the legal system is completely reliable and companies that are investing on a long-term basis and these investments are long-term investments, you really can't move them about, there is some kind of legal security. So if you have a 20-year contract, both the parties, due to the legal system, should respect their commitments. And this is a major asset. And it's rather rare, you see, uh, to see this in other regions but Europe. There are not many other regions like Hong Kong where people, where the legal system requires both parties to respect their commitments. And Hong Kong is one of the countries. And of course, the procedures are rather simple. People are very reactive, are very responsive. And you can really adapt to local contexts and local situations. Hong Kong is also the doorway to China. It was also the doorway to Japan, to Korea. So you really can't reduce Hong Kong uh, to be a springboard to China, let's say. So now, if you can I just open up a few avenues to show you a few things. Hong Kong has remained attractive to both Western companies, both small and medium-sized Western companies. There are two ideas I'd like to share. For Veolia, it's a benchmark in terms of uh, all the in in infrastructure. Hong Kong is a showcase for the entire region. 
And I think Hong Kong can still be a better showcase and it can actually put a good gloss on the entire situation. And there are two fields where I can see that Hong Kong has a lot of uh, potential, and this is going to impact many countries in the world. It's the, en the change in energy policy, the energy efficiency, evolution, the change in energy mixity, and all the and Hong Kong has a major role to play in this field. And it also will set an example for other countries in the region because it's got certain skills, especially in terms of uh, managing IT systems, managing big data in real time. So these are the components of what we call a smart city. And also in the field of environmental protection, Hong Kong has done a lot. It can still set an example on how to protect the environment, especially marine environment. You don't really have uh, sites uh, to build several million, uh, a city of several million inhabitants. And Hong Kong uh, really can set an example for Asia on how you can actually, how a densely populated population can live in a very small territory. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you here today and to share our experience at uh, BNP Paribas. Uh, it's a great honor for me. Uh, Mr. Lemire is my chairman, so I have to be extremely careful about what I say about this, but also because I was born in Taiwan. I was, I'm a native of uh, Taiwan. Uh, my father came from uh, Beijing, my mother from Shanghai, and then uh, obviously I spent a long time in France. So it's been 17 years I've been working in Asia. Uh, the last eight years I spent in uh, Hong Kong, and I'm very happy to explain to you what I experience is in Hong Kong. And uh, since Hong Kong was a bridge between the West and the, the East, uh, I'm happy to be the middleman. Now, for BNP Paribas, uh, well, we don't have um, a recent experience in Hong Kong. We've been there for 56 years. So for us, it was a natural development to have the original center for um, BNP Paribas. We operate in 14 Asian countries, and uh, our staff is about uh, 9,000 people and uh, 2,200 in Hong Kong. So obviously, you can see that uh, Hong Kong is really at the core of our operations for anything that concerns uh, um, financial investment, banking, and also for wealth management. So uh, we also operate in the field of asset management and also in uh, what we call custody. So uh, I'm just going to um, give you a, a few pieces of information. Hong Kong is a fascinating city for French people, uh, 17,000 French uh, residents. Um, many of them decided to um, Many companies decided to set up their headquarters, uh, regional headquarters for Asia. Uh, we have some large-scale companies, but lots of uh, SMEs as well. And we see more and more French companies that come, uh, try to settle in Asia, and their first uh, port of call is uh, Hong Kong. So many figures have been uh, thrown around. Seven million inhabitants in Hong Kong um, for about 275 uh, billion uh, GDP. So you can see that's about 10% of the same as 10% of the French population. Um, and uh, and uh, 1,100 square kilometers. So we use only a very small proportion of the French uh, or the France uh, territories. So this is one of the most expensive cities in the world. So why are we all deciding to be in Hong Kong? Uh, it's been said before many times, uh, we're very efficient, and the infrastructure is uh, 
excellent, whether we're talking about the harbor, the airports, the telecom infrastructure. And also we see it's also one of the best financial infrastructures. Uh, there's the legal framework, rule of law, transparency. Uh, international standards are uh, applied, whether for auditing, uh, the quality of human resources. Lots of talents uh, uh, are in Hong Kong. So, in fact, all this led to the fact that uh, Hong Kong has played a very important role as the gateway uh, with China, mainland China. Now, all these years, and we've been there for 56 years, all these years there has been an ev evolution of Hong Kong. First of all, Hong Kong is, as I said, as we said, the uh, bridge for trade between uh, China and the rest of the world. But over the years, what's happened was China opened up, became the second largest economy in the world. So China exported many tourists, 55 million Chinese tourists come to Hong Kong every year, and out of these 50 million tourists, we have uh, 20 million Chinese tourists. So you can see that for any luxury brand, it's necessary to be in Hong Kong, to be very visible in Hong Kong, whatever the price of the real estate. So over all these years, um, Hong Kong has become a service um, provider, and uh, Hong Kong is now the um, middleman also for financial flows and capital flows. So you see, it's very important. In the 90s up to 2000, Hong Kong was the main financial place for uh, money, for Chinese, for the money markets, for the Chinese. And we see now that it still is a major um, raising, money raising place. So regarding China, not only we have uh, or we do 50% of the trade between China and the rest of the world, but we also have 50% uh, of foreign direct investment. So any kind of direct investment from China will go through Hong Kong, uh, from Europe, obviously, uh, from the rest of Asia as well. But now, because China is becoming wealthier, we see that there's outbound operations outbound direct investment, uh, and Hong Kong, again, is channeling 50% of Chinese investments abroad, overseas. So with the evolution of China, Hong Kong had to adapt continuously, and Hong Kong has become the best place or the best location for anything that concerns Chinese investment abroad. Overseas, China used to be the factory of the world. Now it's becoming the first market of the world. And very clearly nowadays, um, China, China, what did I do wrong, says the speaker. So now uh, China is exporting capital, it's exporting money, and therefore Hong Kong uh, became uh, the, the main a, uh, place for that. For BNP Paribas, in the last 56 years, we have had to uh, follow on uh, and adapt our uh, offering. We used to be a commercial bank, so we were dealing with trade. We were, um, in, we were um, financing, funding um, trade operations. Then we provided support to companies, um, French companies, but com other companies worldwide to set up in China to expand into China. And therefore, we help them finance their expansion. That's what we've been doing in all these years. And as I was saying earlier on, as Hong Kong was becoming the best um, marketplace for uh, Chinese investors, uh, they had lots of ideas, but not a lot of money. So Hong Kong became the marketplace where the Chinese uh, um, and entrepreneurs were coming for their IPOs. And because of that, BNP Paribas became one of the largest uh, um, uh, money raisers. We collected money for many uh, Chinese companies, mid-cap companies. Uh, they had IPOs on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, 1,600 companies are listed in Hong Kong, and uh, about 60% of them are mainland Chinese um, companies. So we really 
helped and supported this. So we have lots of large companies, but also small and medium-sized employees from China are listed in the uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, we also adopt, uh, adapted and adjusted uh, our uh, offering, and so now we work um, for bond issuance in CNH, and these bonds are issued by Chinese investors. So we have adapted our offering to this new situation. Um, we used to be um, advisors for inbound, inbound uh, operations. Uh, we did this for French uh, cosmetics for companies, for instance. We uh, helped them uh, acquiring uh, Chinese uh, firms. Uh, we refinanced them and then refinanced them in the, in the capital markets. So now we're doing exactly the same for Chinese companies, mainland Chinese companies that are wishing to invest abroad. So we adapted to the various flows. We adapted to financial flows, uh, capital markets, and now, with the internationalization of the renminbi, we can offer uh, solutions for hedging, for instance, that is uh, exchange rate, rate hedging on the RMB. And we are also leaders in the secondary market, derivatives on the exchange rates. Uh, with the CNH. So as you can see, we have systematically been able to adjust uh, what we offer to uh, companies. Um, banks should really come to Hong Kong and um, have a hub there, but I think uh, 70 of the largest uh, banks, uh, global banks, are in Hong Kong. But as regards uh, asset management, we have one of the largest uh, share of QFIA, our QFI, and uh, we are now working on the Stock Connect. What does this mean? This means that offshore investors in Hong Kong or somewhere else in the world, now these investors can have access to the Chinese capital markets, bond markets, or share markets. And uh, this allows us to provide our clients access to uh, China for investment. And um, we are, in fact, one of the largest uh, uh, quota uh, holders. With the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect that was mentioned this morning, we invested a lot of money in that, and we're offering an integrated uh, solution to our investors so that they can invest in China, mainland China. So this is our experience. Uh, we're very happy with uh, what, if, what we've done. We have an investment plan in Asia, and we wish to uh, protect uh, work with 3 billion euros uh, in uh, next year. And uh, Hong Kong for us is the best place to be because that's where we have our hub in Asia. And uh, that was the experience of BNP Paribas.